Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Conversations in Black Studies, uh, sponsored by the Wake Forest University Program in African American Studies. Conversations in, Conversations in Black Studies is a series of curated public conversations examining some of the key issues and ideas in the discipline of African American studies. The program invites students, scholars, activists, and the community to engage some of the historic and contemporary questions animating some of the new and cutting edge scholarship in the discipline, thereby creating new knowledge grounded in the critical and comprehensive study of the peoples, cultures, ideas, and expressions of continental and diasporic Africans across space and time. Tonight's guest reminds us that a central thread that guides all of his work is an approach to knowledge that takes seriously that peoples of African descent possess a deep sense of reality, a thought tradition that, that, is, that more than merely interprets what is around us, but can transform and renew these spaces we inhabit, a world we would like to fundamentally change. Joshua M. Myers is Associate Professor of Africana Studies in the Department of Afro-American Studies at Howard University. He is the author of We Are Worth Fighting For, A History of the Howard University Student Protest of 1989, published by NYU Press, and the most recent, his most recently published book, Cedric Robinson, The Time of the Black Radical Tradition, published this year by Polity Press. He is also editor of A Gathering Together, a literary journal. His research interests include Africana intellectual histories and traditions, Africana philosophy, music, and food ways, as well as critical university studies and, di and disciplinarity. His work has been published in Critical Ethnic Studies, the Journal of African American Studies, the Journal of Pan-African Studies, the African Journal of Rhetoric, the Human Rights and Globalization Law Review, Liberator Magazine, Global African Worker, and Burning House Press, among other spaces. He is currently working on a book, uh, his next book entitled Of Black Study that is under contract with Pluto Press. So let's welcome Josh Myers. Josh, thank you for joining us tonight. Oh, brother, thank you for having me. I've been, it's been a joy to watch many of the previous iterations um, of this series. And congratulations on the position. Congratulations on the creation of this very important program in African-American studies at Wake Forest. Thank you so much. Josh, you have an interesting formation, uh, and that formation informs your scholarship. Tell us a bit about how, tell us a bit of your intellectual journey in Black studies. Well, it starts with me in Black community. Um, I'm from I'm a community of people connected to this broad tradition of African deep thought in South Carolina. Um, my people um, originate um, within within the boundaries of South Carolina from the from the Low Country, but also uh, from the area that is right adjacent to the more uh, popular <laughs> associations of the Low Country, uh, what we call Colleton County. And in Colleton County, uh, many of the um, enslavers took their vacations in that area of the state. Um, and so it was not necessarily as productive in terms of the material wealth of South Carolina slavery, but it was also at the same time considered kind of a luxury destination. Um, my, that's where both sides of my family come from, my mother's side and my father's side. Uh, but they um, both went to South Carolina State University. Um, very interesting institution in terms of its formation, um, but um, the, the major public state supported uh, university uh, that is also an HBCU in South Carolina. Um, and so that's where I grew up in Orangeburg, in a university town, um, an HBCU town, also Claflin uh, University is there. And so um, from there, I decided I didn't want to go to either South Carolina State or Claflin. I wanted to, to kind of broaden out and I ended up um, getting a scholarship to Howard University and at Howard University, um, there's a lot of different things that you can become and be. 
Um, and I wasn't sure what I wanted to become and be until I actually went to uh, South Africa uh, with Dana Williams and Greg Carr as a junior um, at Howard University. And from there, my trajectory was in Black Studies, um, even though I never changed my undergraduate major. Um, but I ended up um, going to Temple University to get a master's, and then I stayed uh, for my PhD. And, and in, my, in my dissertation, I actually wanted to write about the discipline itself. The idea of a discipline, the idea of this intellectual space that's dedicated to this specific thing. And um, that sort of brought me back to uh, Howard because at Howard, um, under Greg Carr, there's, this, was this, this was the thrust. The thrust was disciplinary Africana studies, which is to say, how do you create literally um, a department that stands on Africana studies on its own terms that can, can actually create um, the methodological and the philosophical space to say that Africana studies is its own thing. And um, that's, that's why I, where I've been since 2013. Um, and so we're still building it. We're still creating that space. And so that sort of, you know, encapsulates my journey uh, within Africana studies. And of course, Africana studies is also beyond the university. Yeah. Um, so we practice other forms of engaging um, Black communities across the world um, through our organizations, through our um, engagement in terms of building institutions and building um, spaces, but also through scholarship that interrogates all the various ways that African people have made meaning not just since the modern world, but since the first time that we can actually locate evidence of African people studying. Joshua, you, I, I should also add that uh, your extensive, um, in your bio, you also remind us that you currently serve on the board for the Association uh, for the Study of Classical African Civilizations. You're on the editorial board of the journal uh, for ASCAC, the, uh, the Compass Journal of the Association for the Study of the Classical African Civilizations. You're senior content producer uh, at the African World Now Project. And you also served as co-coordinator uh, of the SNCC Legacy Projects, Black Power Chronicles Oral History Project, and an organizer with Washington, D.C.'s Positive Black Folks in Action. Mm -hmm. So you see Black Studies is a broad, uh, it's not just a, an, an academic, uh, it's not encapsulated solely within the confines of the university, and indeed it is global at its core. Um, but you also, in your first book, you write on the the student, the 1989 student movement that's connected with a long tradition of student movements at Howard that really is uh, the birth, the, one, the womb of Black studies. Talk to us a bit about the connection between Black studies uh, and the Black student movement. Mm -hmm. So I did a little student activism uh, while I was at Howard and we focused on, um, we're trying to extend the legacy of Pan-Africanism on campus. Um, and so, many of the organizations that you name are about really understanding our foundations in Africa and connecting that to not just the political struggles, but also the cultural connections, right, that exist in this broad conversation that African people have been having that was disrupted by the last 600 years, but it wasn't erased by the last 600 years. Um, and so in the, in the context of doing that, I was actually asked to uh, organize a youth summit in 2008 uh, by the current leadership of the Howard student government. Now this student government, um, Nicholas Owen and uh, Kellen, um, why is Kellen Smith? Kellen, I think it's Kellen Smith. Um, yeah, they, they wanted to embrace the April Silver Ras Baraka tradition when they ran for student government. April Silver and Ras Baraka were the leaders um, two of the many leaders of the protest that happened in 1989. And um, a year and a half later, they ran for student government because they wanted to actually bring the spirit of protest into this traditionally you know, complex position of being the student government leaders, uh, which at Howard, at any given moment, you can have a radical activist as SGA president. You can have also the most conservative student on campus as SGA president. Um, in the 80s, you had a mixture of both. But by the end of the 80s, Ras Baraka is the vice president, April Silver is the president. And so when I was in student government, 
we ask them to come and talk to us, to talk to us about uh, what it's like to uh, take Howard in a particular, particularly new direction. Um, April Silver was quoted as saying, we want to make Howard Afrocentric um, in, the in 1990. So that resonated with me personally, um, but it also resonated with what uh, we wanted to do during our term um, as student as student government. I was actually the coordinator of, um, it's a term that I don't like anymore, but social justice, because you know they put everything under social justice now. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. Uh, but we, saw, we did Pan-Africanism. We brought Mumia Abu-Jamal through a live from Death Row. We brought uh, Charlotte O'Neill, Bob Brown uh, from the All African People's Revolutionary Party, um, and many other people, uh, including Ron Walters, um, who at the time helps us understand the nature of Barack Obama in ways that blew my mind in 2008 when everybody else was just celebratory. Ron Walters says, okay, what does this mean? <laughs> like as, as the consummate political uh, thinker that he was. And so that's how I was connected or became connected to many of the people um, who participated in the 1989 protests. And so when I came back to Howard in 2014, they helped, they asked me to help organize the 25th anniversary of the protest. The 25th anniversary was 2014. And it started off as, well, Josh, can you write a foreword to the book that we're doing? But then it became, Josh, can you write the whole book? <laughs> <laughs> and so um, it was always with their blessing and always with their collaboration uh, that we end up producing producing the book that becomes We Are Worth Fighting For. It was really in terms of, if you want to look at the normative trajectory of a junior scholar who was going to you know, start off doing stuff from their dissertation and start off doing, it was a disruption for me because I'm, I, I wasn't a historian of radical student movements, but I was produced by them. And so it's less of my academic training and more of my training as an African person in the world, trying to make sense of things and also trying to pursue liberation practices, right? And so you see some of that um, in, the, in the text itself. So everything that the text became was actually done in collaboration uh, from the color of the cover to who to interview to how the chapters were arranged. Um, I was described, I was the researcher, but the, but the spirit, um, I shared alongside the students who were involved in that work, which is I think how we should do black studies. I think that's how you go about um, producing scholarship, right? The individual scholar who knows all does not necessarily resonate in terms of understanding the black experience, right? And so that's something, something of how um, I think about the black student movement and its relationship to black studies. We know of course that it's not possible without the black student movement, but what's your relationship to the student movement now as you practice and research and write in Black studies. Of course, I must shout out the Blackburn takeover that's literally happening right now, right? How do we in fact do Black studies there in that, at that site? And I think that's something that um, I can only, I can only do because that's how I was brought up in the tradition, right? I have to have a relationship, perhaps more than a relationship to that insurgent practice because that's really what Black studies is to me. And that doesn't mean, you know, coming after, you know, three weeks with a, with, a, with a tape recorder and saying, okay, let's do an oral history because one day somebody's going to write a book. Well, that's important. But I'm talking about practicing it in the moment now, right? What is our relationship to that ethos, to that spirit? We've just come out of uh, the SNCC 60th uh, anniversary. Uh, marking 60 years since the founding of SNCC. It's one year off uh, because of the COVID uh, pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic. But in, with your engagement with SNCC, and we hosted uh, our dear friend Charlie Cobb just a few weeks ago uh, on conversations in Black studies. When you think of those uh, past movements, uh, SNCC, uh, we look at stu student movements at Howard, uh, and across the Black University movement, student movements in North Carolina, of course, Greensboro, Malcolm X Liberation University, People's College out in Fisk. Uh, how do we begin to think through the connections between those historic movements in Black studies uh, and contemporary movements in Black studies? Blackburn takeover uh, in this moment, 1989, of course, at Howard and uh, 1989 Greek Fest uh, and of course Labor Fest. Uh, yeah. So how do we begin to think about uh, the long stream of Black student movements and critical Black intellectual production 
uh, in the discipline of Black studies. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm gratified by recent work uh, by Rich Benson, gratified by recent work by Jelani Favors. And you no, know, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, there's a brilliant new book about Tuskegee coming out uh, from that particular perspective by Brian Jones. And so this is, this is just beginning in many respects. Um, and what I like about a lot of the work is it's not only about the 60s era, you know, which there's still many more stories to tell about uh, the 60s era, but at Howard, I mean, one of the things that I had to do, uh, I was asked to do, I should, I should say, um, by those students from 89 is to contextualize and say, you know, we aren't the first. And so they said, kick it back as far as you can. Well, I couldn't go back as far as the 19th century, even though there's some protest activity, but the, uh, you know, it's the 1920s. It's the new Negro era for black people and black students. I was just on a panel at McAllister and one of the question, one of the questions was, you know, Student movement is a is a sixties nineteen sixties phenomenon, and they you know they link it to the free speech movement. And this is where it begins, and even the black student movement, many people believe, is a reaction to the free speech movement. It's like no, no, not even at Berkeley, which is why Cedric Robinson is so important. We'll get to that in a second. But the moment before um, the New Negro movement is really critical for understanding um, what's happening because there's a wave of protest that leads to the wave of the first kind of self-government, you have black presidents now, and, and that really opens up a particular moment um, in terms of the history of HBCUs. And you can't evoke a golden era of HBCUs without talking about what happens by, with students kicking in the door in the 1920s. And I think the same is true when you talk about after the 1960s, because mm -hmm. it's almost as if, you know, when the cameras leave after the takeovers, nothing happened after that. What actually happens is more repression, more black students were killed after the Orange massacre. Um, we have to talk about that because state violence was something that happened on university campuses long before Kent State, right? Long before we get to that kind of moment at, because, because it was happening at HBCUs, very few people beyond the black community recognized that as what it was. So there's a continuation of repression, continuation of state violence and also organizing. I want somebody to really write about the Save and Change Black Schools movement in the 1970s because that's really an important precursor to uh, what's happening in the 1980s and why these students have such an awareness that we're just not going to accept the presence of Black bodies as the solution, right? And that's, of course, connected to what's happening in, at majority uh, white and historically white uh, colleges as well. And so after the, after the 60s is important and you know we just released um, I say we because I was um, part of this in many respects, um, but I wasn't um, as, as involved as Charles Jarman, um, former professor of sociology at Howard in the, the creation of Andrew, a book honoring Andrew Billingsley um, by, um, out from Black Classic Press just recently. And in that book, it talks about Howard in the 1970s and how Andrew Billingsley, Andrew Billingsley is brought to be uh, the department sorry, the Associate Provost of Academic Affairs. Mm -hmm. He's coming straight out of the Institute of the Black World. <laughs> He's coming straight out of Black Studies, building, uh, building Black Studies at Berkeley, right? And so when he comes to Howard, it's like, okay, <laughs> let's get all the Black people that's doing Black Studies and let's put them strategically across the university, right? In the Sociology Department, Joyce Latin, in the Political Science Department, Ron Walters, in Music, Donald Byrd, in Art, Jeff Donaldson, and on, 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 on. Not just in the places that we recognize as human uh, humanities and social sciences, but also in engineering, um, in places that are applied, right? Because ultimately, this is a nation-building tradition. And that was what um, was happening um, in the 1970s. And so the students, I mean, they're getting all of this energy from all of these different spaces. And so they were never going to accept the neoliberal developments that were represented by Ronald Reagan and represented by the right wing of the 1980s, right? 1983, there was another important takeover uh, led by Howard Newell. And Howard Newell is literally uh, a mentee of Kwame Ture, and he's the SGA president. Um, he's a member, he's a cadre of All African People's Revolutionary Party and the SGA president in 1983, 1986, we were just talking about this on Twitter, the Black United Youth, mm -hmm. um, Todd Shaw, who's now at University of South Carolina, uh, Steve X and many others, Aaron Johnson, create this organization to get, get together and study, 
right? But also to confront some of the things that are happening in terms of the evolution of the right in the 19th century. And so 89 is just collecting that and saying, okay, let's do, let's do something more drastic now because now they're on our campus with the representation of Lee Atwater, right? They're on our campus now. And so you don't get 3000 students in that building without there being a long tradition of continuity from the 60s, from the 1920s. And of course, if there's a continuity uh, to 89, there's a continuity after 89. So all throughout the 90s, there are protests, right? The famous one with Chadwick Boseman um, in, the middle of the, in, the mid, in the middle of the decade, right? When through whatever policies or whatever economic uh, rationale, they tried to get rid of the freestanding College of Fine Arts. And so there's a conversation there. And I think part of what we have to do in terms of narrating the student, uh, the history of student radicalism and student activism is not create the grand narrative around the 1960s that we've, I guess, been, I don't know, it's been ingrained in us for so long and look at it more as a continuous narrative. Because once we make the 60s heroic, it becomes much harder to imagine ourselves as being able to do what they did. So it's not a, we're not doing a narrative of decline. Uh, right. It is a, a continuing story, much like, uh, the continuing history of African peoples in the world uh, right. it is ongoing. It's interesting when you discuss that move, when you discuss the ways in which student movements um, and, and student movements contribute to uh, the broader waves that inform Black studies, uh, the student movements from the 20s uh, ongoing. Uh, and of course, we see student movements if we're looking at camp, college campuses, uh, in the late 19th century, there's still stirrings. I remember uh, there were uh, it, there was actually a separation of colleges in Virginia uh, with Lynchburg College, and uh, that's home of Sterling Brown. That's where Sterling Brown is shaped, and Virginia Union, because black and uh, black Baptists in Virginia wanted their own institution. They didn't want an American Baptist institution, but it it pulls us to a different aspect of the conversation around. Uh, black studies and the black university that sort of, you know, captured iconically on the pages of uh, Negro Digest Black World, but as part of a longer uh, arc of thinking institutionally uh, about this about this project of black studies. Um, mm -hmm. Talk to us a bit about how uh, how we can think through the relation between black studies as departments. I mean, what we get at San Francisco State or Yale or at Harvard. Uh, and also the idea uh, of the Black University that's uh, discussed at, at Howard, that's also discussed uh, at, at the Institute for the Advancement of the Arts and Humanities, also at the Institute of the Black World, how we begin to think through uh, Black studies and the idea of a broader Black university. Yeah, yeah. And I must add, uh, what's happening at the University of West Indies this whole time in terms of what students are doing, also at the University of Fort Hare in South Africa is an important site um, of Black student activism that I think we should probably be even uh, be more connected to in our, con in our conceptualization of Black students. Um, so, uh, uh, McCary in Uganda as well. So um, the Black university concept, I think has a lot of uh, different foundations, but one foundation I think is really important is this notion of independence. And one of the things that sort of animates those conversations that took place um, at Howard around the Black University, um, you know, starting in November, 1968, and then uh, with, the with Negro Digest covering, uh, the, covering uh, the issue or talking about the issue in three subsequent uh, March issues is what does it mean for us to actually be independent? And I think, the assumption of many administrative folk in um, HBCU leadership was that we were, and what black students and what radical black faculty were saying is that we were not, that we were not actually independent. And so they tried to model independence by creating alternatives. And so you get the IBW, you get Malcolm X, and you get all of these other formations. And so independence was not just, you know, political. It was that, but it was also conceptual, it was epistemological. 
and this is the part where too often our thinkers who are writing about these pasts don't interrogate enough because it's not enough just to have your own space if you're going to actually replicate the epistemological categories that order and are conceived out of the Western tradition of knowing or, or what we call um, you know, Western disciplinarity, uh, which really comes out of the enlightenment, right? It's not enough. And so the, the epistemological break, the epistemological rupture um, that is represented was something that all of these thinkers are actually actively engaged in. You read Vincent Harding talking about the discipline of history, oh my God, right? <laughs> it's like, history has to be conceived on different foundations for it to be relevant to African people, right? Stephen Henderson talking about the poem yeah. and poetry, right? This ain't just us learning, right? How to how to use and so not just them. I think most of, one of the most more important figures is Sylvia Winter. Um, you know, unfortunately, um, the piece that she wants to write under, in many ways, the in connection with what's work, the work of the Institute of the Black World, um, Black Metamorphosis, it, it's never made publicly available. Um, it will be soon, thankfully. But in that work, she's doing all of that and more, right? And she's taking the study of how African people engage with the, their emerge, how African people emerge in the new world and how we think about that emergence and linking it to the various, not only disciplinary, but also the ideological terms for understanding Black life. And she ends up saying, that you got to understand Jaka Nu, you got to understand jazz, you got to understand the blues, you got to understand these forms of African intellectual traditions more than you understand the sort of external forces or the external logics that try to tell us what Black people are. That's a heavy lift, but it's, the, but it's what we have to do. And it's what Black studies has to be. And if you're going to talk about the history and, and the intellectual foundations of Black studies, that has to be at the center of our conversation. It's not just us diversifying, diversifying higher education, as some works, as some uh, scholarship tries to sort of make its make its claim. It's also rupturing from the intellectual architecture that is responsible for our our, our oppression, and that's the work that I think um, a select few of us are continuously involved in. But I think we have to be louder, and we have to be more insistent that this is what Black Studies is. And brings us, Josh, to your latest book uh, on Cedric Robinson um, and uh, a conversation that, that I'd like to have with you now on Black studies and the Black radical tradition. Tell us a bit about Cedric Robinson, uh, and uh, then we'll move into some, some elements of, Robin, uh, of the project of the Black radical tradition and its deep connections with uh, Black studies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Cedric Robinson would, would say, um, did say um, that he was doing Black studies in early 1960s at early 1960s Berkeley, which is not where people begin <laughs> the conversation. Um, you know, we normally begin with the appearance of departments and we don't begin it there, we begin with faculty and not with students. Mm -hmm. But at Berkeley, they combined a sort of independent, this idea of being independent and also creating Black space, creating autonomous spaces to do the kind of work that was not covered in the curriculum, which is really an important tradition and a strand that precedes 1968 in many respects. Um, but in, at Berkeley, when he gets there in 1958, um, there is no, there's very little places to encounter Western, non-Western culture in the curriculum of University of California. Um, and this is the most progressive model that we have in terms of American higher education at the time. Um, this is a model that says that everybody has access to higher education in the state of California, regardless of race, nationality, so on and so forth. And yet, there's less than 200 Black people in 1958. What's the contradiction here, right? And so that's something that they have to confront. And, you know, he's there alongside people like uh, J. Herman Blake, who um, is a graduate student at the time. And they uh, together are pushing the campus NAACP into a radical direction. Um, they're bringing in speakers who uh, would not be considered uh, prestigious university <laughs> people. Um, and that's what they were told when they tried to bring many of these speakers in, including Malcolm X at the height of his popularity on the West, on the East Coast. 
um, but he was also extremely popular on the West Coast as an active nation of Islam chapter in Oakland. Um, and when he gets there, he electrifies the entire Bay Area, so much so that they ask him to stay. <laughs> and he says, I'd rather stay on the street alley in Harlem than come to, come to the Bay Area. <laughs> But um, no, Malcolm's East Coast, right? He's, but he's but that energy, that energy leads to the development of uh, what is known as the Afro-American Association. It's also, of course, connected to the Pan-African struggle. It's connected to Afri Afro-Cuba. It's connected to uh, what's happening in Ghana. It's connected to what's happening um, in the Congo. That they're they're thinking about South Africa at the same time. Cedric said he lost his religion. This is a this is a. a this is hearsay, but I like it. Cedric so said he lost his religion when he heard about the Sharkville massacre. He said, oh, uh, no. <laughs> if God exists, God wouldn't let that happen. Um, so that was that was a moment. It's a moment. So he ends up uh, spending time in Mexico. There's a long story behind this, but he ends up spending time in Mexico. He spends a, he spends a summer in Southern Rhodesia. He engages with Zapu um, and the work uh, that's happening on the ground there. Um, he engages with uh, Kanu, the Kenyan, the Kenyan movement. Um, he's actually on Jomo Kenyatta's forum. Um, he goes to a rally and secretly tapes it because he's documented. He's documenting African anti-colonial work, um, and he comes back and he writes in Carson Goodlett's Sun Reporter, one of the major um, outlets for Black people in the Bay Area. And the title of his piece was "What Is It Like in Southern Rhodesia?" And he ends by saying that they've done all they can in terms of direct action. They've done all they can in terms of nonviolent protest. It's about to get real. This is 1962. And so when you talk about Bay Area radicalism, right? When you talk about the student movement, it's there. Long before even RAM comes around. And so, when RAM does come around, when the Black Panther parties, both iterations do come around, right? There's already a foundation. And one could argue that that foundation, and I think uh, uh, Waldo Martin and Joshua Bloom argue this. Um, Donna Murch certainly argues this um, in her book, Living for the City, that there's a Southern orientation, that these are, these are Southern people who are migrated, who have migrated to California and they brought that independent spirit that Charlie Cobb talked about <laughs> not, there's not violent stuff that gets you killed, right? And so black power is not a stretch for these people. It's not a stretch at all. It's the logical extension of what they already believe and what, what they already were doing. Huey Newton and Bobby Seale are young people, young, young folk who see these older, older brothers and sisters mm -hmm. in the Afro-American Association. And they say, okay, let's take it to another level, right? And so where are they at? Merritt College, Black Studies in many ways, if you really wanna talk about university origins is in Merritt College, a community college. And so Sidney Walton and that particular tradition, um, Aubrey Labrie is also there. He ends up where? San Francisco State. Cedric makes a decision somewhere around 1968. He's also at San Francisco State. Um, Jimmy Garrett told me this, the great um, organizer, um, member of SNCC, member of the Black Panther Party, he said, Cedric makes this decision that I'm going to, I'm going to step away from the street fight and I'm going to go into the library. He makes that decision at the height of, of 1968 and by the end of that year, um, Stanford is coming, coming calling and says, we want you to, we want you to help diversify the political science department. Um, so there's a movement at Stanford right after the, the uh, murder of Martin Luther King. I think uh, John A. Powell is there. Um, Charles Oshie is not there yet. I think John A. Powell is there and he's a part of this. Um, but, you know, Cedric says, you know, I'm not really interested in the idea of perpetuating political science. And they're like, okay, what well, we need bodies, we need black people. This is okay, but I'm going to help destroy this discipline. <laughs> and, he, and, he, and he does in many respects. So, so, much, so, so much so that nobody on that, in that department could really work with him, save one person. Uh, and his name was Charles Dreckmeyer, and he was somewhat a rebel. 
um, he, had, he had been studying, you know, Indian systems in, in the medieval era and things of that nature. And it's like, okay, go sit, you, you two crazies, go sit over there. Here are the real political scientists. We're doing international um, politics, which is really about America, right? And we're doing behavioral science. That conceptual stuff, it has no basis in the discipline, but even they weren't prepared for what, for what would happen in terms of the explosion of that um, idea in the midst of political theory in the 1960s. Um, and of course, at the same time, you have the National Conference of Black Political Scientists making a break, right? And so they send Cedric to London because that's the only place in the world where you can have a kind of crazy conversations, again, using crazy in the way that they would probably would have used it, that he's trying to have about consciousness and political consciousness. And he's thinking about Malcolm X. He's thinking about African charismatic traditions, John Shalemwe and others, right? Donna Beatrice, right? These people who are appropriating certain elements of something that they can't really capture because it exists among the people first, right? And then they're trying to advance a notion of leadership that centers that thing that already exists within people. That's why people love Malcolm X. That's why they follow Dona Beatrice. That's why they follow John Shindon. It's not because they themselves are individually great. They capture something about what the people already believe. Mm -hmm. So that becomes the basis of his dissertation work, which of course reverses the ideas in many of the ideas in political uh, theory. Um, political theory was, was only saying that the rational citizen is the, is, the, is the basis for how to act in put in or how to predict political behavior, right? It's all about rationality. It's all about order. And when you have disorder, that means there's a there's a break in terms of the rationality of the actors that we have to under, that we can only assign as deviants. And so when voting doesn't work, get deviants, right? When the political system produces a leader like Donald Trump, that's when you get deviants. But what Cedric was saying is deviance is always there. You try to contain it and control it through this notion of leadership that tries to erase the radical potential that people already have. This is a very complex dissertation thesis and nobody wanted to sign off on it. And so he has to struggle on that, on those terms. And I, and I must say, you know, Southern Africa reappears in that work as well. The mm -hmm. final chapter of that work. Um, Southern African people, he says, this is a not necessarily a stateless society. This is a society where the idea of a state wouldn't, wouldn't even come up. That says the difference between, you know, having state models and saying, we're not, we don't want, these societies wouldn't even, even ask the question about the state. And so that becomes his dissertation work. And he goes directly from that as he's fighting to the University of Michigan. And that's where, I mean, Walter Rodney's a visiting professor his first year. They bring in Sylvia Winter. They bring in CLR James. They bring in um, Robert F. Williams. They bring in Grace Lee. Uh, Boggs, they bring in James Boggs, they bring in Ernie Allen. Of course, Detroit is right there, revolutionary, the League of Revolutionary Black Workers. It's a really important moment. There's a lot of ferment in that particular moment. And when he gets to Michigan- Harold Cruz is there. Yeah. Um, Harold Cruz, of course. Harold Cruz is there. <laughs> well, you know, why, you know why I forgot Harold Cruz. <laughs> um, there's a ferment and um, that, you know, it doesn't, it's not sustainable in many ways, according to the University of Michigan, uh, especially when they decide to bring in, you know, radical black students specifically into the political science department called the black uh, movement called the Black Matters uh, Committee. And so from there, he goes to Binghamton. Um, I could spend just as much time talking about his time in Binghamton. And then uh, eventually he becomes the director of the Center for Black Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara, where he spends the bulk of his academic career but he's never, he's never divorcing himself uh, from student radicalism. He's never divorcing himself from what's happening beyond the United States. He's never divorcing himself from this kind of an analytic um, that he learned as a young person in a house full of black Christians <laughs> um, about how to be in the world, how to live in the world, right? He said he lost his religion, but you don't lose the ethos of how to relate to human beings and what that means, right? Spiritually, but also in terms of a moral and ethical code. And so that, that that comes out of him. And it's also present in the work that he would produce. Black Marxism comes out in 1983. Black Movements in America comes out in 1997. 
and Anthropology of Marxism in 2001, but both those books were written as primers for students. And then his, I would say his magnum opus, I know people probably, <laughs> what do you mean his magnum opus? But Forgeries of Memory and Meaning is a work that goes back to his time as an undergrad. He's thinking about the culture industry and how film and theater, but also other forms of media representation are responsible for advancing um, the really the really manifestations of, of racial capitalism, right? The culture industry is connected to the industry that's re, that's you know responsible for the labor exploitation, and in many ways it's it's kind of more powerful. Um, and so that becomes his uh, 2007 uh, book, Forgeries of Memory and Meaning, a book that was long in the making, but it's one that I hope more people begin to read as much as we read Black Marxism, read Forgeries of Memory and Meaning, because guess what? There's Black resistance to that too. There's something called black film. There's something called black theater. And that tradition, of course, has a very specific look in a very specific feel. Um, Haile Garima, who, you know, as we both have interacted with him on, on, on deep levels, um, is an heir to that tradition. And, you know, it's very interesting to see his name in places where we wouldn't have saw his name just six months ago. Um, as you know, black film is becoming a marketing term <laughs> in Hollywood. But what is it? What is its thrust? People like Cedric Robinson were thinking about that, um, you know, in the 1960s and on forward. And that LA Rebellion tradition, you know, the book ends in 1945, which means that there's something before. Yes. Yeah. So. You really highlight and underscore the intellectual practice of Cedric Robinson, one that's deeply informed uh, by those deep Southern roots that are transported across uh, when he moves over uh, to the West Coast. But there's also a way in which he uh, understands the very human element uh, of African world, African existence in the world. Um, and that human element pervades his scholarship. He never allows the uh, categories, uh, the disciplinary frames, uh, the various methodological theories to then interrupt uh, what is the meaning making practices of humans, of Africans across space and time. Yeah. And that becomes a practice that, that really uh, informs and stands at the center of Black studies. How, would, how do we begin to think of uh, Black studies in a moment now where uh, the construct of Black radical tradition, absent that deep intellectual practice, absent those ethical commitments and, and those experiential norms, um, a, a attempt to div, um, move away from that, from an uh, integrated practice of Black studies? How do we, how do we begin to think the Black radical tradition now, um, when we have three, I think this is the third um, edition of the of Black Marxism that's coming out. I can remember reading it. Um, Tommy Bozier gave it to us. Tommy Bozier was the librarian at Norfolk State, and mm -hmm. we went to SGA office and photocopied it. I still have my photocopy uh, copy, uh, but now it's it's not with the Tommy Bozier's, but you know, it's at UNC Press and you know, a number of printings, but there seems to be a, a separation from that practice. Cedric was always about the practice of reading and studying together. So I think that's, you know, something that I learned from Greg Carr. Um, every, you know, Tuesday when I was an undergrad, you know, we would just go outside of the classroom in the hallways you know, and just read and study together, sometimes up to 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. And that was more formative than anything that ever happened in a classroom for me. And that, and that still continues, right? You know, they do it on Zoom now. <laughs> <laughs> it still happens. The Climate to Race Society is very formative. Um, and Black study, that's what I mean by Black study, that space, that, that cultivation of that kind of space. Um, the other piece is that, you know, I always, I, often, I find myself saying this more and more with the, with, with, with the passing years is that the Black radical tradition is not the three people that Cedric writes about in part three of the book, right? They are the, they are the intelligentsia that can capture it. They can be a part of it. They can, in fact, um, theorize it, but they can't be it because being it is literally being with the people. And when people say, who are your people? When Black people say, who are your people? That's what we mean. 
And black studies scholars gotta have people. Mm -hmm. One of um, Cedric's students, Tiffany Willoughby Harrard, says, you know, why don't my colleagues, colleagues know my kids? And it hit me, right? Because when I think about growing up and the peoples around the intellectual communities, really religious communities, right? Everybody knew everybody. And I think Black studies is like that in many respects, right? Um, I can't tell you how many uh, people who are near and dear to me in Black studies, I'd be around their kids. <laughs> I'd be around their moms and their grand because it's about the people. That's the tradition. The radical tradition is how we have literally got over, as Mahalia Jackson would say, and how human beings come together to survive against what, what are supposed to be our negate, what is supposed to be our negation. And you can accept black people's negation if you don't know black people, right? You can actually accept that as an analytic. You can accept that I'm forever a slave if you don't know actual black people, right? If you are not in community with actual black people, that to me is the missing element in many departments of black studies and many formations of black studies, certainly not all of them, right? Because we are here, right? And we can have this conversation. But I think there, that, that is missing in a lot of people's conception of what Black studies is, is actually the idea that the Black radical tradition is constituted by the Black community. And the Black community is the origin for struggle. It's the origin for resistance. It's also the origin for how to live. Mm -hmm. We call it in the South things like home training, things like, you know, <laughs> staying on your P's and Q's. That's ethics, right? <laughs> That's also, I see a relationship between you and me that's not enforced by something beyond, that's something that's not beyond you and me. And so that spirit too, like ethics is not the negation of spiritual, spirituality. Um, and so that's how we all grew up. And that's how Cedric Robinson writes about black people. When you actually peel back black Marxism, when you actually peel back what's happening in black movements in America, says this is, this is an Afro-Christian Christian ethical tradition, mm -hmm. right? That says that certain things aren't going to, certain things aren't going to be okay. <laughs> Meaning treating us like chattel is not going to be okay. Creating a rule of law is not going to be okay, right? And at the same time, we support people that wanna be American, but, at, at, but also, I mean, we support the civil rights struggles in their most moderate formations. But also, we're not gonna catch an L, meaning if y'all project fails, we're gonna build an institution that ensures that our children get fed, yeah. right? And so our best traditions take that as what animates us, right? So we're gonna struggle against the state. We're gonna struggle against um, within, you know, the unethical traditions of the West, and yet, we're gonna build our own stuff because we know that in within our own stuff, we can actually practice what they can't practice out there. And so this is why Robin Kelly says in Robinson's work, the first principle of resistance is maroonage. So I guess I'll stop there because, you know. <laughs> Well, Josh, we've had a, a great conversation and we've talked about uh, your intellectual journey in Black studies, uh, the deep connections between the Black student movement uh, and Black studies, uh, the connection between Black studies and its institutional uh, guides, you know, Black studies as uh, discipline and department and, and also uh, idea of the Black university. And of course, uh, uh, this conversation on Cedric Robinson uh, and the Black radical tradition, which really uh, captures uh, this essence of Black studies, Black studies as a living tradition, uh, right. Black studies as a way of life. Uh, and the Black radical tradition is an extension of that. When we look around, uh, to close us out tonight, when we look around and think about contemporary configurations of Black studies, the uh, contemporary situation in the world we're facing, uh, planetary struggles, a pandemic, also we've uh, put the atmosphere on fire, uh, we've sort of inoculated ourselves with the uh, phrase climate change, but really it's about the future of organized human life. Um, 
in the US, we have uh, various conversations that uh, almost seem to be conversations on Black studies, but they're about something else. And you think of the public discourse around uh, anti-racism, questions around history, uh, new theories that are coming up in the academy, theories mm -hmm. like Afro-pessimism, uh, theories around uh, anti-racism in their, in their newest guise. Where do you see uh, the future of uh, the project of Black studies? Uh, in this moment uh, uh, that's bisected by global crises as well as uh, by intellectual crises? Well, I, you know, like I said yesterday at the SNCC panel, I, I don't really know. I can't predict it, but I do have hope. And the hope is in us declaring our space and saying ideologically, conceptually, and epistemolo epistemologically, African people can stand on our own terms, our own intellectual terms, our own cultural terms. That has to be the guiding light, the guiding force of Black studies. And to the extent that we can actually think about and theorize what those terms look like, I think we'll be okay. I think it starts with first, you know, really thinking about our relationship to disciplines. I mean, that's where, you know, my next book is going. But it's, 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 it's an urgent thing because when you look at the job announcements for Black Studies positions, it's almost always tied to another discipline. And I'm wondering about that in this moment. Is that an academic con con concession? What is that? Is it a, you know, do we lose something with that? You know, I talk to grad students about that all the time, specifically grad students who see Africana studies as a discipline itself, right? Mm -hmm. The next thing is an awareness of um, our genealogies of Black thinking, right? You know, this doesn't start, as we said earlier, it doesn't start with the group of intellectuals in the 1960s, right? We have to deepen our intellectual genealogy, our sense of who counts as an intellectual has to be deepened and deepened and deepened. So I spend a lot of time thinking about music because of that. Um, as a form of, you know, intellectual work. The next piece um, I think is really key. Um, just love, a deep love of black people and black culture. Like you have to love this, right? I think it's um, Hortense Spiller says, you gotta love this flesh um, using um, baby Suggs as from beloved as an inter, you know, as an interlocutor. Um, then of course, um, I think finally, we already talked about living it, but finally, I think we have to take seriously, very seriously, more seriously, especially now that people have, we have more people's ears. And this takes very seriously the practice of teaching. Mm -hmm. This has to be taught. And I think teaching in this moment is going to be more impactful than even, you know, the scholarly work that we do in terms of writing it down, right? Um, it's just the way that attention spans work, right? <laughs> in this moment, I think that, I think reading is going to come back, but until it does, <laughs> you know, we also have to be able to be teachers, and that's where our students are going to pick this up. I don't I don't pick this up without the teaching of Red Car, right? Yeah. I don't pick this up at all, and you know that's something that he learned from John Henry Clark, um, you know, and there's and there's tradition that he learned from Evelina Taylor. Um, who, of course, will never appear in a Black Studies textbook because um, she was a teacher in rural Alabama who said, who, who got John Henry Clark, you know, started. And look what she did by taking seriously the practice of teaching. So, I mean, that's how I would um, orient the future. Let's, let's be teachers. Let's really be teachers. Well, that, that really is a, a great call and a great... Uh way to end our conversation, put a pause in it uh, at this moment, uh, only to continue. And of course, you're surrounded by great teachers uh, at, at Howard in the Department of Afro-American Studies, of course, with uh, the master teacher, Greg Carr, uh, of course, Mario, uh, Mario and, and Valethea. Um, there just is so many resources at Howard. Dana, of course, providing not only great teaching, but expert academic leadership. Uh, so this is, you're just in a, a place where it's generative and you're continuing uh, to deepen and provide an exemplary example uh, for us to think through uh, as we can. Only the university to recognize that too, but it, that's another. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, look, we'll, we'll recognize it and, and, and make sure that, you know, if there's a wave of recognition, uh, then that wave then comes back crashing right back at Howard. Um, so Joshua, I wanna thank you. Uh, Joshua Myers, Associate Professor of Africana Studies at Howard University.
He's the author of We Are Worth Fighting For, a history of the Howard University student protests of 1989, published by NYU Press. And his latest book is Cedric Robinson, The Time of the Black Radical Tradition, published by Polity Press. And you can get both of those books right at Sankofa. Uh, bookstore, Sankofa, it's a bookstore, film store, it's a community gathering space. Uh, you can order it online through uh, Sankofa or your local uh, Black independent bookseller. Uh, Joshua, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for the conversation and thank you for uh, the intellectual practice that's providing us with a light uh, in a world uh, where we see uh, so much darkness, but there are lights lighting up that the light will continue. Thank you for creating this space. It's wonderful. Hey, thanks a lot. Good evening, folks, and thank you for joining us for this edition of Conversations with Conversations in Black Studies. I'm Corey Walker.